Andrew, one of the things that you didn't mention, but uh, which I'm seeing uh, increasing amounts of on the net, has to do with misinformation uh, leading to uh, you know, sort of knee-jerk reactions, uh, flash crowds, and things like that. Um, I think an example of that, um, I'm trying to, I may have been in Korea. Uh, there was a big issue about American beef and, uh, you know, the uh, Kreutzfeld, Jakob uh, Kreutzfeld uh, syndrome. And there was a misinformation that led, I don't remember what fears. And as Vince says, it was fueled by a very healthy dose of quackery. Right, just like complete misinformation about the disease, the way that it's transmitted, and so forth. Um, the political imperative was that this new government is pretty pro-American, and they wanted to complete a free trade agreement with the U.S. <clears throat> There's no way that the U.S. Senate was going to pass a treaty um, unless Korea lifted its beef boycott. So um, uh, in Korean politics, they're very evenly split between left and right. It's a pretty uh, aggressive political environment, um, uh, a lot of um, very um, – uh, sort of heated uh, – uh, uh, I would describe Korean politics as very heated. And so typically when a government of one party or the, or the other takes power, the other side does their very best to go in and kneecap the new president politically as quickly as possible and cripple them for the remainder of their term because they can't run for re-election. So if you can just shut the person down and make them ineffective, they do. And so sure enough, uh, the government announces they're going to lift the beef boycott and the left, the labor unions and others – um, really went to town to try to stir up uh, a popular frenzy of, of opposition to it. And uh, it was kind of fun, actually, because there were Googlers uh, in the Korea Google office who were out there holding the candles and, like, marching on the streets, and other Korean Googlers that were, you know, um, marching on the other side and saying this is ridiculous. It was, you know, a fun sort of political issue. Anyway, we got involved in this because students that were protesting the um, gover against the government um, – uh, were unhappy that the major newspapers, which are pretty conservative, um, were, you know, in their view, you know, kind of unfairly attacking the protesters. And so what they did was they uh, called for a boycott on the advertisers in the big newspapers that are supporting the government. And of course, they used Google Docs to list out all the advertisers. And we had um, the Korean police, now controlled by the conservative government, trying to investigate who were the students that protested it because they wanted to like indict them for some hideous crime of you know uh, spreading false information and so or organizing a boycott and so we actually had like the police raid our office they took eight laptops uh, you know they they held our people up to try to force us to disclose user information that was not being stored in Korea right this is Google Docs stored on data centers over here and so uh, we just had to endure it right but it was an example of, of how serious they, they, they sort of take that. I think that what's interesting is um, there is clearly a cultural thing that I don't particularly understand about um, Korea and China and to a lesser degree Japan where um, uh, rumors fly very fast and often have pretty dire consequences. So in Korea there's been a spate of suicides of very well-known, very successful actors and actresses over the last two years – and at least the media story about it is that part of the blame is because there are rumors about their personal lives and about their, um, uh, you know, uh, doings or whatever that um, get reproduced by the internet. So the internet clearly has this ability to like damage reputations, and uh, search engines like Google make it awfully hard for people who have had negative stuff about them written to ever move past that or get beyond it. And I think that's very troubling. I think the, 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 to me the ultimate question is whether you need to exercise some form of control in order to stop that or whether we can develop a kind of understanding about the limits of uh, truth, <laughs> the limits of speech on the internet that within you know, maybe 10 years will be much better understood and will know better how to kind of read and filter those sorts of things and discount them properly. Um, anyway, that's how I think about it. I wanted to comment um, on your point that the cost of networking has dropped and so it unleashed creativity. I think it's not just the cost of networking, but the bandwidth as well and um, accessibility. Because in the past, people had access to the networks of personal relations, so they could publish their creations. But the, those networks have rates of about 0 0.01 BPS. And now we are eight orders of magnitude ahead of that. So this is actually the driving force. Be, be that's, a, that's a really good point. Stephen? So related to Vince 
line of, of questioning, I think, is um, could you comment on the role of the Streisand effect? Um, I mean, said the, the, you know, the, the example that immediately springs to mind is that there's a little town in England that no one would know about, and thus their concerns about having relative anonymity would be addressed, except they stormed a, you know, a camera car. <laughs> Well, so I look. I mean, to me, these things, from from a, from the sort of social engineering perspective, to me, these things are all of a piece, right? Which is that people don't really understand what this network means, right? They don't really understand what 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 the implication is. The, the Streisand effect, you know, is uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, if you're googling the term, you probably figured this out already. But the Streisand effect is basically like like reacting to something you don't like on the internet in exactly the wrong way, which is to try to attack it or shut it down and therefore draw more attention to the thing that you're trying to shut down. Um, and uh, uh, I just, to me, there's they're sort of like symptoms of a moment of massive technological change that take a while for people to kind of like figure out and get used to. Eventually, right, um, copyright lawyers are going to figure out that wildly overbroad assertions of copyright are going to, you know, not be worth it because of the negative reaction that you uh, uh, spark. You might say the same thing about record companies or others. Um, you know that suing you know grandmothers um, is not going to actually prove to be you know the most um, effective way to uh, win the loyalty of your users. To me, that's all kind of a, of a piece of just people um, uh, seeking to utilize some kind of control mechanism where another approach would probably be more effective. I, I, I got a quick point on that because you just said something that I viewed as, as implausible, which is you said lawyers would learn. Law, lawyers, <laughs> lawyers' jobs are to bill people, okay? And so, I mean, that except for some really exceptional lawyers who view their job as, as doing, you know, advice to clients about, you know, public relations strategies. But that's typically something that somebody, not an attorney, does. The attorney's job is to ex use the legal system to their clients you know, the way the client wants it used. So the answer is the lawyers themselves have no motivations on that and, in fact, are trained very specifically that it is poor behavior on their part to leave any attempt, you know, any part of the possible legal process untouched. So they will issue the broadest possible subpoena because that is what they are trained and, in total, indeed, professional ethics requires them to do, which you really, I think... What you really have to do is expect that the people behind the attorneys learn that that's the wrong thing to do. Because then they can instruct the attorneys instead, come to, come, give me a resolution that doesn't cause the following negative effects. Okay, But if you just set the attorneys loose and say, stop this, the, the attorney's job is to be as broad as possible and to do all the things that you, we all view as socially reprehensible, but in fact, legally and ethically, they're required to do in many cases, but at least in the United States. Your example proves the point that if you're not part of the solution, there's good money to be made in prolonging the problem. <laughs> well, yeah, well, certainly. I mean, it's a good point. But to, to me, what that says is um, – I mean, of course you're right. It's, it's the clients that need, need, need to be persuaded. Um, to me, what that says, though, is, that it is, is how important it is to get the rules right. In other words, the, the law really does matter because you should just assume that people will take advantage of it. I mean, a great example, just to play off of what you were just talking about – um, you know, a great example of, of where you need the rules to be right um, has to do with um, the standards for access to data in the cloud, right? So, um, you know, the things that used to be under your desk uh, in a file cabinet are now extant on some servers that are held by some third party somewhere else. And right now we have a set of legal standards that makes access to that information held by the third party extremely easy. Even though it's exactly the same data, we've had this conception which says in the house, very highly protected out of the house, not as highly protected. Now, in the house means you've got like a netbook um, is the thing you have in the house and the data actually resides somewhere else. And just our legal standards, uh, if they're going to capture these old constitutional notions of privacy, have to be changed. Otherwise, lawyers will, in fact, in every divorce action uh, you can think of, will go and try to subpoena the hell out of everything they can get their hands on. The legal rules really do matter. So I, I, I empathize with your morning uh, routine. Uh, I understand uh, and, I, and I mention it because I'm trying to separate out the essential from the ephemeral here. Um, how, you sketch some very, very broad um, forces that are in play. Um, in essence, Moore's Law and, and all of the consequences are going to happen irrespective of 
the control of the Communist Party or any other uh, political thing. And it's the interplay of these that are, are, are playing out. To what extent does it matter how much energy we put into worrying over this? Um, is it going to proceed along that path anyway? Or are there specific points where it does matter because that's the way in which you bend the tree or bend the river and then you get very, very different outcomes depending upon whether you take action now. And so it's separating out what the inevitable from where the major choice mm -hmm. points are. Um, so really interesting question. Um, so, so my take on it is this, which is that um, uh, – A series of choices that, you know, you all were involved in that are embedded in the way the Internet works and where the standards are written have proven to be surprisingly resilient, in my view, to um, efforts to exercise some form of control. And by control, I mean, you know, um, even things as kind of picayune as um, certain traffic management techniques by, um, you know, like by a cable company, let's say. And uh, – the thing that I think is not inevitable that is worth paying attention to are the purported um, advances in the network that would build um, um, an ability in network operators to understand and then um, uh, understand what's flowing over their networks and then uh, alter traffic patterns and flows and maybe even destinations and so forth of traffic based on what they want to do rather than what the endpoints of the network would have wanted to do. To me, that matters tremendously. And I think that the great conflict has been that nobody wants to harden the Internet in the same way that we want – just like I don't want the law to kind of harden the – preserves of intermediaries of information in the old pre-internet days onto the internet. I don't think anybody wants to harden the architecture of the internet such that it can't evolve and we assume that we've always gotten everything right up until now. On the other hand, um, I, I get quite concerned when I see this kind of what to me looks like sort of an unholy nexus of, um, of uh, forces coming together to try to um, build – better tools of control into the network. And the, that ne the, those forces are um, people that would like to stop copyright infringement, people that would like to protect children better, people that would like to have better law enforcement access and surveillance capabilities in the network, people that would like to have political and social control exercised through the network. When you add that all up together, that's a pretty powerful set of forces, even in a country like the U.S. or the EU, that would like the internets to evolve in a direction which I think is pretty – unhealthy and by no means is it inevitable that the internet will repulse that just as it's repulsed I think a number of, of threats up until up until now so I don't view that anyway as inevitable hey, let me just add I think this is one of the very best presentations on these issues that I've ever seen and uh, I, I'm really keen to yeah. thank you so much I've had a couple years of practice so um, the way that we thought we would do this uh, this next sort of panel is, uh, is um, uh, Rick Witt um, published a number of years ago, what, seven years ago now? What, um, what was at the time a, I think, a very influential uh, paper about how to think about the interplay between regulation and control and the network. Um, and so what I've asked is, is, is Rick to um, sort of revive that picture, and then Alan and Nicole will come down and we'll try to dig into some of these issues. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. It's always a, a challenge to follow one of Andrew's presentations. I would decline the invitation if I knew it was actually going to work out this way. I'll do a truncated version of some slides I put together, try to set the, the agenda for, for the rest of the panel here. Um, as Andrew mentioned, we're all about the eighth and ninth layers of the Internet. There was some IETF engineer, I think, back in the 1990s who coined that phrase, and that means uh, economics and politics as the eighth and ninth layers, respectively. Um, you can also think about it in, in the terms of, of Larry Lessig. It's code is law, but by the same token, law is code. And so we work on the law side and try to figure out as best we can how to preserve some of the, some of the normative values that Andrew talked about um, in his presentation. So 
uh, a lot of this is actually going to be self-evident to some of you, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, these are actually taken from some slides I use when I try to talk to policymakers, federal, state, international policymakers, about the Internet, about what's going on in the Internet and how it affects or should affect their way of thinking about networks. Because I'm the telecom guy and the staff in D.C., I think of myself sort of as the plumber. So I'm kind of in the weeds on what happens at what is called the, the, the last mile by the incumbents. I tend to think of it as the first mile. But uh, nonetheless, so this is kind of this notion of what is convergence all about. And um, as I explained to some of the, the, the policymakers, convergence is true to a certain extent if you're talking about increasingly uh, networks and enterprises are converging to the Internet, to the, to the IP protocol in particular. Um, but it's, it's a mistake to think of it as convergence beyond that because really what's happening at the same time is a divergence in terms of the networks that are supporting IP then all the applications and content that's flowing uh, out of the networks, and so it creates what's been known as the, the virtuous hourglass. Uh, a couple of things that come out of this, um, in addition to Vince's famous, uh, I guess, on the, on the front of Board, uh, Boardwatch magazine, the, the, the IP on everything uh, T-shirt that he exposes, uh, uh, memorable cover. Um, it creates some interesting economic uh, elements, which in turn then bleed right into the political layer as well. The first is that the net is a complex adaptive system. Uh, and if you talk to any complexity scientists, you know, theorists who talk about this kind of thing, uh, what it basically means is it's a highly uh, evolved, uh, very advanced, extremely complicated thing made up of many different parts, uh, of which comes lots of emergent behavior. Uh, and that emergent behavior, for the most part, is unpredictable because it's, it's the interaction of, of lots of independent elements working together, and that the whole is the greater than the sum of the parts. In addition, the net has become uh, a general platform technology, and again, in the words of, of the economist, the GPT, um, and that means a platform for innovation and growth. And if you talk to people in New Growth Theory School of Economics, like Paul Romer, what he talks about there is increasingly we have an economy that's based on ideas and not on things. And we talked about yesterday and again this morning, the economics of scarcity versus the economics of abundance. And this is a radical change in the shifting in the past, just the past 10 years or so, about what the, the Internet is actually doing and the effect it's having uh, on the market in a larger sense. The third part of, to keep in mind here is that in the old telecom space, services were always inextricably tied to the networks. So you had a cable company providing a cable service over a cable network. Now, of course, none of that is true. You've got uh, the services are now becoming applications, bits of software that are residing on the network, any network uh, using the IP protocol leading to the fourth element here, which is that the core, the intelligence is moving to the edges. And again, this is no surprise to most of you, but to many policymakers, they're like, wow, really? That's, uh, that's really interesting. So uh, Blair Levin, who's an analyst at Stifel Nicholas in DC and was a member of the Obama transition team, uh, wrote a piece about three years ago, which he talked about the internet becoming the battleground for what he called the value chain tug of war. What he means by that is that increasingly, as the value, of course, is shifting from the cores of the networks to the edges of the networks, you're seeing uh, some, as as uh, was put by, by Andrew's presentation, the empire striking back. The notion that, hey, wait a minute, this is our network, this is our value, you shouldn't be taking this from us, this is kind of our God-given right. Um, and you're seeing between networks and users um, battles over many policy issues. Network neutrality, of course, is one of them, but increasingly it's going to be in things like intellectual property, privacy, security, all the way down the line, all of these, these, uh, these skirmishes uh, breaking out uh, in D.C. So uh, as, uh, as Andrew mentioned, I, I wrote a little paper a few years ago uh, with, Andrew, with uh, Vince's uh, support and encouragement, which I appreciated, uh, which tried to look at the world, the policy world, not just the, net, the network world, you know, the OSI stack, but trying to bring to Washington the idea of starting to look at things not in the, in the typical silos of the different service industries, but at the different layers. And so it's, it's actually, I think it's, it's helpful to think about what's going on in D.C. in the past 15 years in terms of the policy wars by looking at it in terms of four basic layers, physical, logical applications and the content or interactivity layer. Uh, uh, Susan Crawford likes to talk about that as a social layer. She doesn't like the word content. It's like content is just about stuff. This is really about people interacting and doing things together. So however you want to call it, that, that top layer is where much of the, the activity takes place. Um, the physical layer is where the battle over the Telecom Act of 96 took place, a battle which has pretty much been won now by the incumbents, the Bell companies in particular. They were supposed to unbundle their network, provide interconnection, uh, and provide some competition to the inter-exchange carriers. Now the inter-exchange carriers and the CLEX, for the most part, are gone. Uh, there are some still hanging around in a few places, but by and large, the physical layer battle was won by the incumbents. 
the logical layer then was the next next place where uh, skirmish broke out, and this was uh, the ISPs, the independent ISPs like Earthlink and AOL, uh, and this was the, the, the notion of ISP open access. And back in 2005, but the Supreme Court acted and called the Brand X case. The FCC acted three months later in a broadband order, which essentially deregulated the incumbent carriers from having to provide access, ISP access, to independent ISPs. That battle also won by the incumbents. So quickly between the physical and logical layer, we now have a world where we used to have ISPs. You, you talk about ISPs. I used to think about them in the old days. Yeah, yeah, seven, 8,000 ISPs out there in the country. Well, now you, you mentioned the word ISP. You're talking about the carrier because there are no other ISPs for the most part out there remaining. So now we're at the third stage of this battle, um, and this is where it gets really interesting. This is the, what's known, of course, as network neutrality. Um, a couple of quick words here about network neutrality. I'm not really fond of the word. Some people call it net neutrality, but I think it actually makes it a little bit worse. Uh, I think some of the problems with the, with the nomenclature go to the fact that, of course, the net is not a neutral place. Certainly you have the end-to-end -end, uh, principle. You've got a lot of the architectural elements which are there intended to allow people to do what they want on the net. But people take the notion of net neutrality and they try to argue, well, but of course all these things are happening, people using CDN networks and all these commercial transactions, people getting one up on the other. But of course it's all true. We're not talking about the net in itself. What we're talking about is the broadband network. We're talking about the last mile slash first mile of network. Um, and so it's really the focus is on what's happening at that layer and at that particular part of the network element where there's less competition. Um, and it's about openness. How you want to define openness, it's basically the ability of people to come in and do what they want to using their broadband connection. Now, a couple of things here which may be a little surprising to you. Network neutrality, people usually then add the, the tagline regulation after that or legislation or rule. Um, net neutrality to me, network neutrality, open internet, it's about the end game. It's about the end. It's not about the means. Um, in fact, prior to 2005 on the, on, the, on the broadband side, and of course we always have had on the dial-up side, we've always had network neutrality. We've always had a world where people had the right to use the ISP of their choice, and that ability to use that in combination with the non-discrimination principle meant that people had an open internet, had access to do what they wanted to with whatever provider they wanted to use. Um, the problem now, I think, increasingly, people talk about net neutrality as if, it, as if it inevitably then comes to some sort of regulation, some sort of prescriptive approach to ensure that that openness stays in place. That's not necessarily the case. In fact, I would argue that right now, in a world without a net neutrality law or regulation, we more or less have it. Um, and that's, I think, primarily because the incumbent players, having seen what's happened with Comcast and the BitTorrent situation at the FCC in the past year and a half, and a few other things that have, that have broken out, they've realized it's probably, uh, probably better for them to stay on the sidelines uh, with their business models and not get too aggressive uh, because they've now got a Democratic Congress, you have a Democratic administration which ran on a network neutrality ticket. You've got an incoming FCC which will be headed by a guy who knows the internet well and by all accounts is, is a fan of openness on the net. So I think they've made the, the correct business decision to lay low and not get out there very aggressively with their business models. So we essentially have this environment now, whether or not we have legislation or regulation to enforce it. Now, the final part of this, is, it, is that enough? That's, that's really going it, to – it's unclear. It's too early to know. Is the norm of openness is relying on end users and early adopters and the net community to be kind of the enforcers, as it were, of a net neutral environment? Is that sufficient for us to, to not have to worry – about the incumbents. Um, again, I think it's premature to say that, that the answer to that is in the affirmative, um, but at least something to think about. Uh, quickly, also broadband. Uh, you hear a lot of talk about broadband with the broadband stimulus money, seven plus billion dollars that the Department of Commerce and the FCC and the Department of Agriculture will be administering. Um, and folks kind of ignore the notion of what is, what is broadband? What do we care, why do we care about broadband? Of course, broadband is a medium. It's a way of, of taking communications infrastructure and making it work faster and, and the ability to provide services that were not available in the previous incarnation. But it's important to know what it's not. Broadband is not the Internet, and broadband is not Internet access. So if you read the, the legislation, you read FCC regulations and the like, all the focus is on broadband. And yet, if you think about it, well, it's not just broadband as a capacity. We want interactive online services that reach and use the Internet. To say that, for example, it's a content delivery system, well, yes, in part, you can use broadband as some kind of neat one-way video streaming uh, service. But if you're going to spend $7 billion in stimulus money or $1 billion in broadband uh, universal service money at the FCC, um, 
to basically allow Comcast or Verizon to build a much bigger video plant. I'm not sure that's exactly what Congress had in mind. It's also not a box of widgets. The economics of broadband are unique uh, from many other kinds of products and services. It's got very high upfront costs. You're utilizing lots of public resources, whether it's rights of way, conduit, polls, uh, lots of tax breaks and subsidies, it's uh, depreciation, et cetera. So it occupies a different kind of place. Above and beyond that, if you go back and look at the, the, the world of common carriage, common carriage didn't start because there was a concern about somebody having market power. They, it started primarily around instrumentalities of communications and transportation. And that's been that way for, for many, many centuries, going back even to Roman law. Um, and so it is, there is something different about communications infrastructure from other kinds of, of elements of the economy. And finally, it's not your vegetables, right? We can talk all we want to about getting a, you know, one gig to every home tomorrow, but for uh, a lot of people, surprisingly large number of people, they don't see utility in broadband, whether it's because of price, whether it's because of concerns about online, you know, nefarious online activities affecting their families, et cetera. Um, we have to really be, I think, focused on the demand side of the equation and not just on supply. And finally, I'll leave you with this. This is uh, my attempt to think about broadband in terms of three different dimensions. So the first dimension, as we've talked about, and the one that the regulators mostly focus on from the perspective of getting more infrastructure out there into the economy, it's what I call availability of broadband infrastructure, right? So you just want to make sure you have more bigger, faster, competitive pipes, wireline and wireless pipes out there available for people to use. The second dimension is the one that people don't talk about too much, which I kind of alluded to earlier. It's sufficiency of net carriage. You can have the biggest broadband network in the world, but if the provider does not actually devote some portion of that to the Internet, then the notion of broadband as some sort of optimal platform for the Internet, of course, is, is, is a misnomer. It's not going to happen. So you have to be at least concerned about and think about how much capacity actually is going to net carriage. And the third piece, integrity of net access, is simply open internet, i.e. network neutrality. So these three, I think, work together um, in terms of, to me, kind of building a notion of what is the right kind of a platform, broadband platform, to create uh, an open and robust access to the internet. Again, not to suggest that this then leads ultimately to 100 pages of regulations that, that mandate this, but to say these are the things we should want to, I think, care about uh, uh, going forward as a matter of public policy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, so about people not wanting broadband, my impression from what I can tell, and part of this is the Department of Agriculture briefings and the NTIA briefings and all that stuff which I've watched and tracked, is that there is, an, and, and from talking with some folks in the area, there's actually a tremendous demand for Internet access in at least the rural underserved areas, the farmers, the farm business guys who currently are dialing in and frustrated when they're trying to figure out what the futures prices are and whether it's time to sell their their crop in advance and other sorts of things like that. Um, is, is that fair? Are you, are you going after those folks when you say people don't want it, or are you worrying about the 50-state mandate and the fact that some of the underserved areas are, frankly, going to be you know urban areas of folks who really may not wish it at this point? It's not their vegetables. Right. Um, so if you look at various studies, like the Pew Internet folks do, a variety of studies around this, uh, Consumer uh, Federation of America has done some studies, CWA, there are some, I think, commonalities across all income classes, across all geographic areas. There's a certain percentage of Americans, uh, 20, 25 percent, let's say, who just don't see the, the utility in broadband. But as you point out, in the rural areas, it's the so-called unserved or underserved areas, there is a tremendous, uh, there is tremendous pent-up demand because at this point, unlike in a lot of suburban areas or urban areas, where at least there is some broadband, some places. There are, there are real issues having broadband anywhere there, there, and it's in part because of the cost of building the broadband plant. It's in part because the, the middle mile, the, the, the backhaul access to the Internet is, is quite poor in a lot of those areas. Um, and so that's, in my estimation, that's where most of the stimulus money, that's where most of the national broadband plant activity should be focused, is on upgrading, building that new plant. And um, as Mark Cooper at CBOA says, it's not a matter, again, of getting everybody on the network at 50 or 100 megabits. Just give everybody 500 kilobits in those areas. Just get them on the network in an always-on connection. They can experience broadband the way at least many of us experienced it from the beginning. And then that creates its own demand and the, own, and the market forces take over and people can start you know, getting up to higher speeds. Yes? File on 0929, and you're going to file on 0951? 
Uh, so I didn't file an 0929. Well, I filed 0951. Are you, are you talking about an NTIA for, for stimulus money? Uh, uh, lawyer code uh, for uh, 0929 is the FCC um, yeah. policy making proceeding. That it's a docket number, literally, for how the stimulus money should be spent from a policy standpoint, which is we what he was talking about. Uh, yeah. 0951. Um, is still open. That's the uh, what the national broadband policy uh, should look like. So we're members of the Open Internet Coalition, so we submitted comments in 0929. We've submitted some separate comments and letters to NTIA uh, about how to use the stimulus money. The comment cycle for 0951 is, begins on June 8th, and Google does intend to file some comments there, which may look something like what you saw on the screen a few minutes ago. I think I would just add, we're, Google's not attempting to be a recipient of stimulus money, right. which I think is important. For us to just get on. Google's not trying to get a, be, be a recipient of stimulus money. Just be on the record on that. Um, so let me uh, now show the visual that I'm going to ask the three of you to react to. Um, just by way of quick introduction, for those of you that haven't met them yet, Alan Davidson uh, runs Google's office in DC, uh, is a longtime internet policy nerd and former uh, actual engineer well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, who programmed, uh, among other places, at NASA. Um, Nicole Wong is uh, Associate General Counsel, Deputy, Deputy yeah. General Counsel, and um, uh, is my partner in crime on uh, those scary morning emails that I mentioned earlier. So I think you two, you three need to move off to the side for a second, otherwise you're going to get uh, the lights flashed in your eyes. So what I want to show is, is, a, is a, a visual just to get our discussion going. Um, and uh, for those of you that maybe, if you are inclined to be offended at things that offend people, uh, leave for a second. But I think we often tend to be a little bit uh, squeamish about actually talking about the stuff that we're talking about when censorship happens. But I just want to show you uh, uh, an example and show you, uh, and then uh, describe the consequence. And then I'm going to ask the three panelists to react to it and to describe um, both what they think is going on and what sort of the policy angle is. So. This is a video that was posted up on YouTube. For those of you that don't know, uh, Greece and Turkey have a fairly um, intense rivalry between the two countries, a set of kind of antagonisms. And about uh, a year and a half ago, roughly, there was a surge of people posting videos uh, from the Turkish side insulting uh, Greeks and their national icons, and from the Greek side insulting Turks and their national icons. Here is uh, a prominent and notable example. This is uh, Kemal Mustafa Ataturk, the founder of the modern Turkish state and a revered uh, secular figure in modern Turkey. You get the idea. Uh, Kemal Ataturk uh, uh, it, uh, raises uh, uh, points about his sexual orientation and perhaps his gender. Um, and uh, uh, we can kill the, the monitor now. And so this video, among uh, a handful of others, um, has led to uh, the banning of YouTube uh, in Turkey. And I, I think you can kill the screen if you want to, and we'll get back to the panel here. Was to get YouTube banned? Uh, well, you do it because you're 16 and you think it's really funny to, you know, insult the soccer, t you know, the other soccer team I think, Yeah, like I think some of the original ones were like following a soccer match, and it was Greek users that were uploading these videos. So, so here's the, so, so the situation is Greek people put up video, Google gets sued in Turkish court, Turkish court orders nationwide block on YouTube, um, which is still in place today, right? So still today, you can't access uh, um, uh, YouTube from a Turkish ISP unless you're tunneling your way out or, or, or using a VPN or something like that. So um, let me start with Nicole. So let me just ask you to sort of like describe the, 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 um, the, the sort of legal situation that surrounds this video um, and Google's actions. And then I'm going to ask Rick to talk about it from the sort of network layers and control perspective and Alan to talk about it from the U.S. Uh, side. So... Um we, yesterday actually was the one-year anniversary of a block that was put in place. We, we had been going up and down in Turkey for several months um, where we would uh, 
find out that the Turkish government, or, or actually it's usually by local prosecutors, are upset about a particular video. And sometimes those videos are things like the Gay Ataturk video. Some of them were um, videos that were of the PKK, which is the rebel uh, terrorist group and terrorist as, as recognized by um, most Western countries. Um, sort of recruitment videos of, when I looked at them, men running around in the hills with guns. Um, some of them were Kurdish nationalist videos, so it would be people, um, Kurds espousing statehood for, for folks in, the, in that part of the country, um, which were hard to identify as actually illegal, unless I suppose you speak Turkish, because when the videos were coming to me, and, and I, I take it Andrew was talking about, we get them at like 2 o'clock in the morning, and there were like 67 videos they were upset about. One of which was literally, it was a woman sitting around with livestock singing, apparently a Kurdish national song. I didn't know that, but, but that, that's the nature of the stuff that we end up seeing. The, the legal construct around that, um, and the reason the prosecutors will bring these cases is based on a couple of laws, but two really important ones. One that makes it a crime to uh, um, insult Ataturk, the founder of the Turkish Republic, which is, Andrew has already informed me, like dead 70 years. Um, and, and that was the video that you just saw. Um, and, and then second, um, anything that essentially insults Turkishness. So that is things like um, the, the Kurd uh, statehood, Kurdish statehood videos, um, anything that sort of offends the state. Um, and, and those are the types of things that we see coming in. Um, uh, sometimes those those complaints are bubbling up from the pop people within Turkey, and then they go to their prosecutor, and the prosecutor brings the, the case. Um, the interesting wrinkle in Turkey uh, that has resulted in our, our longstanding block is that the, the Turkish prosecutors and, and, and the courts and the authority that actually institutes the blocks, the telecom authority, will not tell us which videos they don't like unless we register as an entity within Turkey subject to their laws. Right? So, so we're ending up in sort of a, a strange jurisdictional problem where we have this service called YouTube. It's global. We offer it to the world. But, but in order for us to find out even what they think is offensive or illegal in their country, we actually have to submit to Turkish authority, which would mean that effectively they, they want to be able to censor this global product for the whole world based on Turkish laws. Um, and, and obviously we haven't done that. That's the reason that we've been blocked in Turkey for a year. Rick? And so from the network side, one of the real problems with this kind of situation is kind of the blunt force instrument used by the regulators to try to halt the flow of content that they're not happy about for whatever reason. This goes back many years, and Vint remembers this actually, the, the, uh, the Nazi memorabilia, I think there's the, the, uh, the Yahoo case in, uh, in Germany, um, which you know, went on for a number of years. France. France, I'm sorry, France. My apologies, France. Um, and so you know, when the regulators see something they don't like, rather than say we're going to stop that one piece of content or, or that one uh, activity, they go after the whole site. So they want to bring everything down, and, and by doing so, of course, they get your attention. But it also brings down everything else which, which was not offensive and, and otherwise serving the interests, one would presume, of the, of the end users. Um, there also is the additional overlay on top of that of, in some places, if you have a server in somebody's country serving the content, then uh, ostensibly you are subject to their regulations. If, however, your server is in the United States and people are reaching you, uh, you know, through the US.com, uh, um, then, you know, I think it's our belief that we have the right to, to put that content out there uh, according to the laws uh, and the norms of our society. You know, I guess I would just add a couple of, a couple of things. As, as uh, Rick sort of uh, mentioned, this has been a known bug for a little while, right? Um, the Lycra case was probably the wake-up call in circa 2000. This was the case in France where uh, some French uh, NGOs basically sued uh, Yahoo about some Nazi memorabilia that was available not on their French site, it had been taken down on their French site, but was available through their U.S. site. And we have seen since then a number of cases like this. Now, you know, Rick is, you know, so part of the problem is the blunt instrument issue, which is that the governments actually don't necessarily have available a, a the ability to block a particular video or the, you know, through an order to their ISPs necessarily. Um, 
But I think the bigger issue and the one that we worry about a lot in the United States from a public policy point of view is this broader jurisdictional problem, right? Which is if the government of France can say, or the government of Turkey can say, this video is offensive, take it down. But by the way, it's being served from uh, a service in the United States. That means they have the ability to basically reach in the United States and take and, and you know um, uh, control the content that is published here. Uh, and that doesn't scale very well, right? I mean, we leave our, we, we find ourselves in a situation where it becomes a, you know, the most restrictive uh, uh, rules govern, right? Where every publisher in the world now needs to worry about uh, if my content can be viewed somewhere, does it meet the rules? And that that is not a tenable place. And what's kind of interesting is we haven't solved this problem. Like in you know nine years since Likra, we've really not made a lot of progress in dealing with it. Well, and let me just add something, and then there are two questions. But I, I think what we're also seeing is a hardening or an attempt to harden some of these jurisdictional boundaries. So the, the open Internet that I know some of the architects of, of which are here today um, is actually facing real con- real pressure from governments themselves and, and surprising governments. So um, we've known that Germany, for example, will require filtering of certain types of what they think are content that they think is damaging for children, that's been in place for a few years. But Australia just passed an ISP-level filtering law um, that they are in trial right now with six companies in Australia. It's a Western democracy that is requiring filtering. So it doesn't even matter what we decide to take down or put up. The ISPs are blocking it. Italy has one on the table now. Um, and, And so one of the trends that I'm really worried about is that We've all had our eye on the ball of places like China and Turkey and Vietnam, but we're talking about Western democracies that are instituting these filtering laws that will change the nature of both infrastructure and how we deal with policy. And and when that happens, the conversations that we end up having are with Turkey and China and Vietnam who say, well, those guys are doing it. Why would you have a different judgment about what we do? Right, and the old, the old conventional wisdom, I'm sorry, the old conventional wisdom was you can't regulate the Internet. This is what Andrew was saying. You know, it's John Gilmore, it's censorship is just damage, it's John Perry Barlow telling, you know, the cyberspace declaration of independence. Uh, but what we're seeing is, in fact, the new conventional wisdom is actually there are a lot of ways that we can regulate the Internet, and not all of them are very healthy. So what we've got to do is just say, it's not just a descriptive thing to say the Internet is a force for freedom and you can't stop it. It's got to become this normative defense of the, the core values that Andrew is talking about. I know there's an eager right. question. So, right there. so uh, let me see if I can take this argument up one level, which is um, 15 years ago when we were looking at creating ICANN and all the processes for namespaces and that we were already getting hit with these issues of property and intellectual property rights. I know that some of the people who were off doing that went off and started consulting with attorneys about international law and the question of sort of, you know, treaties between different countries that might end up regulating these sorts of issues. And the answer came back is we're a substantial dif- distance away from being able to put in any international property rights framework that would allow us to arbitrate this. It's now 15 some odd years later. Um, are we... L- and you're raising other sets of questions in which you've got multiple governments, you know, as you were saying, Western democracies as well as different uh, styles of, of governments which are uh, trying to place limits on the Internet. Is there a chance that that will end up becoming enshrined in international law as a set of uh, restrictions on you? Is that an issue you're looking at? I mean, is, or, or is the hardening of particular country boundaries apparently the way people have decided to go instead. Can I just say, if, if we're laughing up here, it's because Andrew is showing on the video screen here the videos that he won't show publicly, um, and I'm really glad you're not. <laughs> I'm giving you, giving you a preview of what you might get to see next. <laughs> Sorry, Nicole, go ahead. Um, so I, I think there are a bunch of forces at work. I think that there are some countries that are seeking to act unilaterally, right, to, to protect, to, to sort of reinstitute a virtual jurisdictional boundary that, that looks a lot like their geography. Um, at the same time, I think that, for example, Google um, has been involved in a process, helped found a process that started with Andrew three years ago um, and was launched four months ago with Yahoo and Microsoft and a number of human rights groups and other um, stakeholders. So it's a, a multi-stakeholder process called the Global Network Initiative. And that initiative is basically to set out some principles um, that we as companies would abide by in terms of what do we do in response to demands to censor, what do we do in response to demands to produce information. That is a non-regulatory way to try and push back a little bit. But but I 
I, I think the promise of that process is that you would have companies standing firm together and saying, we won't do that. Um, and then NGOs with them, hopefully, that say, yeah, that, that's the right way to go and push policymakers in that direction. Let me just underscore say, there's a, we have a lot of nervousness about sort of an international you know, regulatory approach. And you can look at things like this jurisdictional issue and say, well, look, you know, the, the elegant solution actually is some form of lightweight uh, legal regulation. You could say, uh, you know, the approach that we've taken is, uh, you know, a, a country should have control over its uh, domain, for lack of a better term. And we've been using actually domain names. So in Google.fr, we follow French law. In Google.de, we follow German law. Google.us, we, you know, in Google.com, we follow US law. And that's a, and then we, you know, we have a legal construct on top of that about where the substantial contact, con contacts are that would lead to a jurisdictional trigger that would give the government of Turkey the ability to deal with this video, for example. But that requires some kind of international legal understanding. We are, and you could imagine coming up with one, say the Hague is, has, uh, there's been a, a Hague convention that's been looking at jurisdictional issues in e-commerce. There, we have substantial nervousness. We are all lawyers, to your earlier point. We, uh, I think, have a very realistic uh, understanding about what can happen to regulatory structures, and we haven't had a heavyweight legal uh, regulatory structure for the internet so far. And we uh, honestly, I think we should all be concerned about what one would ultimately do. And so, you know, while it is a way to solve certain problems, I think we all have to be a little skeptical. Let me let me just offer up one uh, maybe somewhat more pointed answer. There is absolutely zero chance that there will ever be a treaty uh, that the U.S. will sign that will uh, cut back on the First Amendment with one footnote, um, and that footnote is copyright and intellectual property. <laughs> um, so if you view that as an exception to free speech, which in some conceptions of you know sort of the Constitution it is. Um, there, there is a real effort to try to harmonize, uh, to use the kind of trade lawyer's term, harmonize international rules around copyright. Let's be, you know, to be clear, copyright is a restriction on speech. It is a socially useful and important one and constitutionally validated restriction on free speech because it prevents uh, people other than the creator uh, from uh, – deciding how and when to uh, reproduce their work. So it's quite useful, but it is nevertheless a speech restriction. And to, um, I think it was Alan or Nicole said this earlier, a network-based implementation of um, affecting that particular speech restriction can easily be used for other things which are not copyright, which are political or social or um, uh, 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 economic or whatever. You can use it to control information and that's one of the things which has caused a lot of people to be worried about the copyright battles in the international domain is because what you do in order to protect yourself against copyright in one, uh, in one instance for very good and legitimate and valid important reasons can uh, immediately be repurposed to serve a very different function by people with very different objectives. I can just add on to that. In the United States, there's a very similar debate going on now about de deep packet inspection uh, technologies used by the broadband providers. And very similar arguments are being made. We need to have this in order to filter content to ensure that copyright is being protected. And obviously, people who have, who have copyrights have the right to have those, that, that content protected. One of the concerns is how, how is that you know, interpreted? How broad is copyright law uh, interpreted in states? But beyond that, can DPI technology then be used for other things? Can it be used then to ensure privacy, to ensure security, to ensure a, a number of things? That, oh, by the way, maybe you know, third-party deals to prioritize certain traffic over other traffic, et cetera. So there are real concerns about kind of setting the bright lines between what's acceptable and unacceptable use of these kinds of technologies. Let me, um, if I, if I might, let, me let me jump in with a, a slightly different perspective here. You're having this discussion sort of on, on a sort of formal uh, legal framework, but there's a, um, there's a kind of a broader – uh, trend that is playing in both directions, which is what is the role of nations and, uh, and although not quite identical, language groups, cultural groups, and so forth. And it cuts both ways. On the one hand, we have a homogenization process underway, a globalization in which everybody should have access to the same content, everybody should be able to talk to everybody, and so forth. And we also have a specialization uh, trend underway in which we want to serve uh, uh, smaller and smaller groups. And Google actually, I would say, it plays uh, very directly toward providing different content to different uh, countries exactly by serving 
uh, .fr, google.fr and google.de and so forth. In fact, when I'm traveling and I try to get just my regular Google, it's hard to do that because I have to find a way to subvert that specialization which is being uh, uh, offered as a service. Sorry, uh, we're trying to read your mind. Yeah, right. re read my mind, right. So uh, I, I don't know where all this is going to go. I mean, I appreciate this is a very, very big set of issues, but on the one hand, you, you have the um, problem of how do you serve and, and respect the um, – um, the, 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 I want to try to use the right unloaded words, not needs or legitimate needs or any of those things, but you know, just the, uh, the extant uh, forces that put cultures and nations together and make them units of some sort versus uh, this uh, reducing the distance between peoples and, and breaking down barriers and so forth. That's going to play out. I mean, the Internet is only one big piece of this, but I mean, this is a general trend across a much bigger uh, spread of things. Um, and I don't know that this is going to get solved. We have the same thing within the U.S., just uh, 50 states with different laws about what constitutes pornography and so forth, which uh, you guys could probably cite the, the, the cases about how you get arrested for somebody in Kentucky downloading something that was created in California or, or whatever. The, the I, I, I think that's one. totally right. And, 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 it is, and, and in some ways, when I talk to, like, our engineering teams, this is actually almost – this is the technical challenge, right, which is how do you serve – the, the people in a personalized way with the services they really want and yet continue to enable that global exchange. And I think the answer at a really high level comes down to making sure that what you've built in is choice, right? That, that and, and building into the design the, the ability to choose because sort of when I try and think about how I would want the world to work, I would want for us to be able to say, you know what, my kids are online. I want them to have this universe, and I, I don't need them at this point in their development to go beyond this universe. And I, I think that that's one aspect. On the other hand, there's a lot of levels of that where I'm, uh, there's a notion of sort of like freedom to travel, right? I should be able to get a visa to where I want to go and get into to have a different experience. I should be able to go and see what Cuba looks like. And, and, and so to me, on the Internet, I should be able to go and see what the experience for a local person in Turkey looks like. Right, and you're asking a question about choice, and I think governments are going to want to continue to seek control, and citizens are going to want their governments to seek that control. And I think what you're seeing actually is a lot of continued experimentation, just really quickly on the governance side. So, you know, David Johnson and David Post wrote this wonderful article in like 1997 about how we might see this emergence of new rule spaces on the internet where people competed among, and they would self-organize within communities. And we have not seen that, but it's an exciting idea. You've got things like ICANN, right, where there was this hope that we could create a non-governmental organization for management of key resources, right? And there, and you know, there are a lot of, you know, we've got some great people who spent a lot of time in this. You know, the jury is still out about how effective that mechanism is going to be over time. And so I think we are still in the experiment, experimentation phase about what these governance mechanisms are going to look like. Nicole, that's to underscore what Nicole said, the importance of these sort of self, self-organizational things, self-regulatory things like what we've been trying to do on content with this Global Network Initiative, or whether you can come up with tools – you know, whether we can engineer some of this so you give people more control over their lives online, and that helps take some of the pressure off the regulatory side. Okay, sorry. Yeah, go for it. I'd like to look at the, the problem the other way around. You're saying that the countries are trying to unilaterally stop access to this information, but we are also, you know, uh, we are also trying unilaterally to impose the U.S. Constitution on everybody else. We're trying to tell everybody you have the right to bear guns. We have, we're, you know, we're telling everybody it's free speech except for copyright. You know, copyright is a U.S. Uh, you know, Western construct. You know, China doesn't doesn't believe in copyright. But we're trying to impose our rules again, uh, you know, against them. Why don't we have a YouTube.tr that, like, you know, that, that works well for Turkey? We and we do, but they don't they won't allow it unless it's uh, globally blocked, yeah. right? This is the point about Turkey is that they're saying no YouTube in Turkey unless you remove this video from everybody worldwide, right? So that is maybe so, I mean, making you your point in a different else, way, right? right? Like call call it 
call it meetube.turkey, right? Like, you know, it's, you know, the name is kind of irrelevant. No, no, no but my, my point is that, they, but you see, they're not trying to enforce Turkish law in Turkey. They're trying to enforce Turkish law globally. They, they, the statement they wanted, they said is, um, by having these videos available around the world, you are offending Turks around the world. Take it down globally. So, but he has a good point. Right. That no, no, but, but, but actually, I think that it's, it's more, I think it, it's a great point. No, I, I just Let's think it, it's, the, it furthers your point, which is to say it's not just the U.S. trying to impose its will globally. Other countries also would like to be able to impose their will globally. But we're also arguing here for openness, let's just say, as a value, right? I'm sitting here saying we should be defending these core values, that this jurisdictional problem is a problem because you're going to impose a restrictive speech regime, for example. And you're saying legitimately, well, why, why is that the right value? No, I'm defend? saying why are you imposing the, the right to bear arms on other countries? That's where, like, you know, that's where... You mean like, speech, the about, the right, the, speech you know, about the right to bear arms or the actual right to bear arms? Well, if you if you talk about the speech, you can't tell people to kill, right? Then there is there are I'm talking about the, the the constitution itself, like the the different amendments. Right. So the right the, to bear arms the, means that you can own handguns without the government telling you you can't. But are you talking about speech advocating that right? No, no, you're crossing to to amend you know two different amendments. Yeah, in in a way, yes. Uh, I mean, when, when we're trying to say we believe in the, our core values, our core values include the First and the Fourth Amendment. So I, I actually would frame it differently because I don't – I think we get um, distracted when we talk about Google trying to vindicate the First Amendment. I would say that we're trying to vindicate freedom of expression as expressed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and that, to me, is a global principle. It is, it is a derogable right, which means that there are exceptions to it, but they're very specifically articulated as well, those limitations on it. And, and, and so I, I, I don't I, – we have had that flaw because I think we've come – and I'm a First Amendment attorney, so I'm going to come out, come out with what, what I know, which is to refer to First Amendment rights, but I actually don't think they're First Amendment rights. They're freedom of expression rights, which should be global. So that's what I mean. That's where I, I guess we disagree. I mean, I come from a country that went into civil strife for like 20 years, most of it because of the ability to speak, because there was like hate speech. Uh, what what country is that? Lebanon. Lebanon. Yeah. But people don't kill each other because of speech. Oh, they, they kill do. each other. They, they do. They kill I mean, each other because they decide to kill well, each other. Otherwise, we can say like you know, arm you know. Guns don't kill people. people right, but I can people. insult you right now in your country, and you probably won't kill me. I think some people in my country <laughs> may actually kill you if you insult them. That's, so, that's, but this that's is, the problem. This is the ultimate normative question, right, that, that, <laughs> that Andrew raised, right, which is what for the, for the structure of the Internet, what is the normative value that we should be designing toward? And, and I think one, one, one answer is should we be designing to try and respect – the, the very specific normative values of Lebanon and what is okay and not okay to say. That would be one thing to try and do. The other is to design toward what I think it started with, with is openness and that we'll find a social way to deal with um, what people can and can't say with each other. And, and I think the importance of talking to a room like this is – I, we are still so much at the toddler stage of what this will be, that, that designing in a rigid way how people communicate and what they can say to each other, I think is a very dangerous place for, for us right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, let, let, me, let me just the, – the point that you're making is one that I'm uh, – that I, I think is really, really compelling and important, right? So, so it's, it's one that, 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 that matters a lot to me, though I think we ultimately disagree – Right, but I think that what you're posing is there are cultures that have different points of view about free speech, and it's rooted in a different point of view about what the purpose of society is. Lebanon, maybe like India, is a place where coexistence is more important than individual expression. Right, so people not killing each other is a more important value to you and probably to many of your country mates than uh, giving everybody the right to speak to each other. Um, I think at Google, if we've got any kind of a normative value. It has been uh, very much contrary to that. I don't think of it as a First Amendment thing because, as Nicole said, the First Amendment is a restraint on federal government activity and you know, so forth. But it's a, it's, a, it's a notion of the human uh, individual adult, anyway, as an autonomous moral actor. 
And as an autonomous moral actor, you have the right to read what you choose to read. You have the right to speak what you, what you wish to speak. Other people can read you, not read you, do what they wish, but it's this notion of, of, of moral autonomy and crediting uh, the intelligence and dignity of that individual with the freedoms that go along with that. So to me, that's the sort of fundamental thing that's embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that we have identified at Google as kind of like the normative value we're trying to vindicate. And it comes into conflict with different judgments made even by democratic societies um, and societies with very different historical experiences. Some, like in the case of Germany or India, or I take Lebanon too, that are based in a real ground reality which is profoundly different from our own. It's a real conflict. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any easy way to solve it other than to uh, uh, keep talking about it. Two more questions and then we're into the next period. We should end. So, just a maybe it's a small question, but um, uh, Steve just said, "Well, when I go to some other place, I have to figure out how to subvert what it is you've done." I think the peop the internet, and maybe really the people that work on it, um, are rather innovative in subverting various things that that get put into place, causing all sorts of legal and political type of questions. Um, Somebody like Google would be in the position to facilitate this uh, if they so desired to do so and enhance it. Um, what's going to happen uh, if if these uh, hardening of borders and hardening of um, restriction uh, increases? One would imagine that there will be an equal and opposite reaction in terms of technological innovation uh, that will try to subvert it. What what do you see? How do you see this is going to play out? So it's interesting. I actually got asked this question um, yesterday at a panel at Yahoo um, by a guy who's founded, I think it's called Anchor Free or something like that. It's basically a proxy server that lets people in certain countries access as if they were coming from a US IP. Um, and he's like, so what does this mean for your business? And I'm just a lawyer. I don't know what it means for our business. But he, what, what it does for me is confirm that um, – users and entrepreneurs are going to find a way to communicate with each other to access the information they need. And, and that's sort of the, the brilliance of the vibrancy of how the internet was constructed is that you can have that happen. Um, I think you're probably right as you see more rigid things like the Australia filtering law taking place. Uh, you know, there's a number of other countries where that's going to happen. Um, you, will, you will find users who will find a path around it. Um, and and it, until we can find a way to swing the pendulum back. And I would just say, you know, we've played with gloom and doom, but I, I'm a little bit more of an optimist <coughs> about openness as a value and how much it's likely to take on. So just I guess one second, probably the most important debate that's happening and that's been happening in Washington over the last hundred days, there's a lot of things going on, but the thing that, uh, an interesting thing that we've been involved in, one of the more interesting things, let me put it that way, here's the debate, Rick has described it very well. You have an incumbent that's built a network, uh, really wants to, custom to control over it. You have new entrants who really want to innovate without permission. You've got consumers who really expect to control what happens on that network. Um, you've got a government that really wants build out. And so uh, there's a lot of tensions there. The issue has nothing to do with telecom. It's actually the energy grid. And what's happening right now is a big push to think about the internet as an analogy, right? And actually, so we've got $11 billion in this economic stimulus package to build out a transmission in this country. It's incredibly important because of renewable energy and trying to get it from place to place. But buried in that bill is a requirement that all the 40 million some odd homes that are going to have these smart meters uh, under the stimulus package, that there's an openness requirement. Open standards and uh, must be used uh, uh, under all these projects. And that's a huge, uh, that's a huge development, actually, in terms of creating an energy internet. Some people have talked about it. But it's also sort of a, an interesting idea that this, this set of values that we've created for the internet um, and openness chief among them actually taken, taking root in other areas. And so I guess I would just use it as an example saying I'm a little bit of an optimist that uh, openness in and of itself and the kind of values that Nicole is talking about actually are very compelling for a lot of different reasons. And hopefully we'll see them you see some of these uh, norms taking hold rather than needing to have a big legal, heavyweight legal regime. Optimism from D.C., wow. <laughs> I'll, maybe I'll just uh, I'll make one concluding note um, on that question, which is um, uh, 
So Google does some things like HTTPS access to Gmail, for example, and uh, we've had, it's no longer supported anymore, but we had a product called the Google Web Accelerator, which is basically just a piece of software that lets you set up an encrypted tunnel to Google servers for your web queries. Um, and uh, there are things like that that a company like Google can do, but uh, the bigger you are, uh, the more vulnerable you are to government pressure. And so if I were internet users now, I would not rely on big institutional players like Google uh, to try to solve those problems. I would instead be looking towards the smaller, the more innovative, the more nimble. Um, I think Google will probably be a pretty reliable player in trying to provide access to information and communications and uh, in ways that are private. But uh, it doesn't obviate, you know, even a very enthusiastic Google would not obviate the need for um, uh, other more um, uh, guerrilla style solutions to evading censorship and evading uh, these restrictions on information that uh, that that a user might feel are unwarranted. There was See, an article in the Times recently about a group of software developers who had developed um, you know, precisely that sort of infrastructure for Chinese users who wanted to get around the Golden Shield. Um, <clears throat> for, and and the Iranians were using it, and to such a degree that the. Chinese community had to close it off to non-Chinese users because their infrastructure was getting overwhelmed and, and proposed that then the Iranian community was going to, you know, of, of expats would be constructing this infrastructure outside of Iran for, you know, their families in Iran to use. So it might be interesting to develop some kind of meter around how much energy grid is consumed by infrastructure developed solely for the purpose of Rotting around damage. Last I, comment. I wanted actually to attract attention to um, the quantitative issue behind censorship, which is how small a minority is empowered to take down content. It's not just about countries or different cultures, but even inside completely homogeneous social group. Some individuals have different opinions and they may be offended and they may want to take down content or comment on our links that this content is unacceptable. As an extreme example, I can um, give my own experience. I put some song lyrics on UCSD website, which was there for 10 years. And then someone called the department and said that they are offended by the lyrics. So they took it down. Uh, that's also a very important note. We tend to talk about China when, in fact, what we're talking about is a set of individuals who happen to hold power in China at this given moment. Sure. That's a very important point. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you very much.